Milwaukee Paranormal Conference. Uh, I sort of made some similar remarks yesterday when we kicked stuff off with a really fun Friday night. We had Ghost Story Happy Hour, and I did some trivia, uh, and people won some interesting prizes. Um, and then Sunspot gave us some beautiful, eerie music. But anyway, uh, the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference, if you're not familiar, has been around since 2015. Uh, we've had ups and downs over the years, um, but you know this year has been super crazy, and we wanted to keep the tradition going. Um, so we're glad that we can offer some really cool presentations online, and that everyone can enjoy this for free and from the safety of their own homes, because we don't want to get um, anyone sick with this awful pandemic this year. So thanks for joining us online. It's good to see everyone virtually at least. And I hope that you enjoy this really awesome lineup of people that we have all day long uh, today. And we're also doing some fun stuff like virtual tours and a meditation session and a documentary screening tomorrow. So uh, welcome to the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference 2020. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk about ghosts right now. Sounds good. Um, well, I mean, fantastic. We have a bunch of different ghost cities represented today. Uh, so just in case you guys uh, are not familiar with us, um, there's a company called American Ghost Walks, and we do haunted history tours across the Midwest. Represented today um, are Lisa from Madison, Wendy does Waukesha, Melinda does Lake Geneva, T is a guide in Milwaukee, Allison is a Milwaukee researcher, she wrote the Milwaukee tour, and so we just thought we'd go through and everybody just tell one of their favorite ghost stories from the tour. So, who's feeling spry on a Saturday morning? If we were all up in person, I'd make everybody do jumping jacks, um, <laughs> but we're not. I am, uh, and, I am. Okay, Allison's doing jumping jacks. Okay, Allison, why don't you kick us off then with the ghost story to start on? Oh, Judy S., was I supposed to wear a suit? Well, <laughs> only if you're going to be in my house. Just your birthday um, suit. Just, hey, <laughs> that's right. That's right. I didn't take, right, I'm not wearing pants. Um, <laughs> you don't need pants. That's the beauty. That's right? the beauty of, of virtual conferences. Yes. Uh, so, Allison, why don't you kick off uh, with a story for us? Um, one of your favorites? Well, there's so many haunts in Milwaukee, but I think my favorite haunt is the Milwaukee Public Museum. And that's because there are uh, so many witnesses uh, that have experienced the haunting there. And it's also uh, exciting because of who the ghost is supposed to be. Mm. So, um, so we're talking about a guy named uh, Professor Borghegi. Professor Stefan Borghegi uh, was actually from Hungary and he was an amazing uh, person. He uh, was active in the resistance during the Second World War. Uh, he was a baron in Hungary, uh, rode, on, rode on horseback, was a championship fencer. And then he, he came to Milwaukee and became the director of the Milwaukee Public Museum from 1959 to 1969. And he was Milwaukee's Indiana Jones Be, before um, that character was even imagined. Uh, Borhegi was traveling uh, back and forth uh, between Milwaukee and South and Central America, bringing artifacts back for our museum. But unfortunately, his life was cut short uh, on September 26, uh, 1969. He was on his way to the museum and he got in a car crash and was killed instantly. Now, soon after that accident, people at the museum began reporting strange activity. So. First, they noticed something strange with the elevators that uh, although they had, and all elevators are supposed to, uh, for safety reasons, default to the ground floor, um, they would um, 
instead seem to default on the third floor and on the fourth floor. So uh, the third floor was actually uh, Borhage's, um, the, the fourth floor was where his, his uh, office was located and the third floor, uh, if you go there today, you'll see that that's where all his collections are located and you'll, you'll find a portrait of him there. So at first the elevators started having that that weird uh that weird activity where where they began to uh, go to these places uh where uh, Borhegi frequented in life as if transporting an unseen guest and uh i think my favorite story from the elevators is a little a little girl was on there with with her mother and they were actually going to visit uh, a curator up on the sixth floor and so they, they got permission to go to the sixth floor. They're riding up. And then um, on the on the fourth floor, the doors opened and no one was there. But then the doors closed and, you know, the mother didn't think anything of it. But she was watching her little girl and uh, the eyes of her little girl seemed to be following someone uh, in the elevator that she couldn't see. And then the little girl turned to her mother and said, who's that man? So Vorhege has man manifested in many ways. Uh, that's a very minor one, but it does, it, it did affect a child. And so last year when I was doing uh, the yearly tour that I, I do a, like a mini tour for the Milwaukee Public Museum, a mini, mini haunted history tour. And while I was, while I was presenting, uh, this little girl said that she saw a man in a hat. And um, Mike, maybe you can pull up that photo again uh, of Borhegi. Uh, Borhegi is actually represented in the museum um, in a couple of places. You'll see uh, his picture. Uh, he has a portrait on the third floor and then up on the mezzanine, there's a big photo of him along the shores of Lake Amatitlan um, above some uh, Mayan artifacts that he had, he had collected from that Guatemalan lake. But he's also seen on the third floor in uh, the Morocco area wearing a fez. <laughs> so I thought it was really funny that the little girl um, talked to her mom and told her mom that she had seen a man in a hat. And she was kind of fooling around and the man in the hat <laughs> told her to settle down and listen. <laughs> All right, Borhegi, Borhegi's on my side. But anyway, she came up and told me that afterward, and I wish I would have had the opportunity to talk to that little girl and ask her more details about the hat and about the appearance uh, of this person. But uh, he has been seen um, as a, a specter, usually in a, a long black cape. And the reason for that is uh, when he was alive, he had a, a lot of idiosyncrasies about him. And one of the colorful things that he liked to do in Wisconsin cold winters is to wear a long cape instead of just a boring old winter coat. So he's been seen on the third floor and the third floor mezzanine. Uh, and he's been heard on the fourth floor. Uh, there's just so many different stories about him. Uh, and there's other stories too um, of specters associated with the mummies there uh, at the museum. Uh, and so here's a picture of a mummy that uh, is very is very scary on the on the third on the third uh, floor mezzanine. And uh, I use it to great effect uh, when I have little kids on the tour uh, one year. One year they actually had the whole floor blacked out and I got to use flashlights and it was just so much fun to pan up on that face. And then I heard a little <laughs> girl scream to her father, no, daddy, no. And I knew that I had hit pay dirt, but this mommy actually does have a story. A, a security guard saw a, a black figure um, up on the mezzanine and, 
and thought it was the shadow of something. She was chasing this, this black shadow down the hallway and then it turned the corner to a dead end. And at the end of, of that hallway, uh, she thought she was going to catch a perpetrator and instead it was just this black amorphous cloud which um, disappeared uh, through the glass and into the mouth of this mummy. So <laughs> that was quite off-putting for the witness. But uh, the reason I think Milwaukee Public Museum is so incredible is because so many people have had experiences there over the last 51 years now. Uh, and my my stories uh, actually came from the opportunity I was given by a curator there at the museum who now oversees Borhegi's uh, collections. And she had her very own experience with him, she was uh, walking uh, on the uh, third floor and suddenly she felt this chilling pressure pass through her body. And as she stood there like shivering and shaking, wondering what the cause was for that, uh, she would find no explanation. There were no air conditioning vents. And even if there were, uh, what she experienced was nothing like anything she had ever experienced before. It was a penetrating chill that shook her to her very core. Later, she would muster up enough courage to talk to co-workers about what had happened. And uh, and they said, oh, that, that's just how poor Hagee says hello. And she, she turned out she wasn't all that special. He walks through a lot of people, apparently, um, not only curators, but also docents and sometimes even guests. Uh, one more story from the India area. Wait, wait, what's a docent? Oh, a docent is a volunteer at the museum, a volunteer like museum tour guide. Okay, so they just call the, like, just like, get over here, docent. Yes, they're called, that's what they call them. They call Get them me docent. coffee, docent. Okay. One uh, security guard also told me about a guest who uh, one day was in, um, also on the third floor of the India room. And uh, so she was standing there, like looking at the elephant. And I like this one because it's just like so crazy. It sounds like something out of Ghostbusters. She's standing there, and then all of a sudden, this swirling vortex appears in front of the elephant and and threatens to suck her in. And it's just like so much like some kind of sci-fi movie that uh, I find it entertaining. And then she she took her little girl and ran to the security guard and was just beside herself that she had seen, you know, some kind of uh, a sp spiritual whirlpool perhaps uh, swirling in mid -e mid air by the elephant in the India exhibit. So that's my favorite, that's my vote uh, for my favorite haunt in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Public Museum. That sounds good. And I think about the Milwaukee Public Museum, the only thing that really terrified me there was the uh, Tyrannosaur eating the, uh, like the stegos, the Triceratops. Oh, Like it's yes. so gory because you see the inside of the Triceratops, like you see his guts. That's and your first remember, exposure to such gore. Right. So that unmitigated I, terror. I blame Dr. Borhagi for making me the guy that loves horror movies and gory stuff now because he because it's his fault because of that tyrannosaur. That, well, and it may that, be. I, I know he was personally involved uh, in constructing the streets of Mo old Milwaukee, for instance. Uh, it was very much his belief that uh, it was important to have immersive experiences in museums. So, uh, that terror is what got you to remember that exhibit after all these years. Well, and that and the other thing is that there's the Indian exhibit, there's the Indian diorama or whatever, where you can hit that little button and the rattlesnake's tail goes. Yes, so that's, that's very the other cool. immersive It makes you feel like you're there. It does. And I think Dr. Borhegi himself, to feel immersive, he actually had eaten Triceratops guts himself. Like he went. <laughs> And uh, Back that was in time thing. through the swirling vortex. He went through the swirling vortex <laughs> and he got with his, with his just with his teeth. But that's a great story, Allison. Um, Thank you. Oh, okay, Lisa. Um, we're going to be talking about some Madison ghost stories tomorrow when we go to the UW uh, virtual tour. But why don't you uh, hit us with one of your favorite ghost stories that you like to tell uh, on the tour? Well, my my tour is a little compact this year due to the plague. 
But um, I've been working, I have a thing for theaters and my theater ghosts. And yesterday, Mike and I had a fabulous opportunity to go and get more information on one of my favorite theater couple ghosts. So I'm gonna be talking about our Capitol Theater, which is now tucked away in the middle of our fantastic Overture Center. It was built in the 1920s. You wouldn't see it from the street, but once you get in, it's fantastic. So a couple years ago, one of the security guards cold contacted me. He's a retired police officer here and goes, hey, I got ghost stories. And I met up with him and he started telling him to me and whenever something he would, ha would happen, he would send me a little message. So yesterday, Mike and I got to go record something for a ghost light program that the theater's putting on for Halloween. And I got to hear all about my favorite ghosts. The two I want to talk about that we know their names were Sid and Pearl. Now, Sid worked in the theater when it was open when he was like 13 in the 20s and continued to work till his death till 2001. He was an usher and they dressed very dapper and he loved the theater and he met the love of his life, Pearl, there. So this couple, from their youth all the way to when they got older, lived, worked, and breathed in this theater. There are a couple stories about them in the hall wondering where to go because it's been remodeled so dra dramatically right now that the entrance isn't where it used to be. But my most favorite story, one of the ones that the uh, security guard, my friend Bruce, led off with is he said one night people were in the theater and they saw this couple come on stage and start dancing, like waltzing. The gentleman was in a formal tuxedo-ish outfit with a hat and the woman was in a ball dress and they were just having a good time. And the people up in the balcony didn't realize they were ghosts, the two cleaners. And they're like, they yelled at them because they shouldn't have been there. It's the overnight crew after hours. So the ghosts look up, they stopped waltzing and walked out. The same time they did that, someone was coming from backstage to see what they were yelling about. And they said, did you see the couple? Where, where did they go? And they're like, I'm the only one here. And I find it amusing that whenever anything goes wrong in the theater, for instance, last year, one time the lights went off in the bar area, the bar manager immediately goes, oh, Sid, it's Sid again. So Sid actually contributed a lot to the theater and developed their volunteer program that gives tours. And since we all like a little creepy, we'll talk about our, um, a creepy magician from back in the day in the vaudeville times in the beginning. He had a thing for a dancer and he was one of the booking agents there. So he kept booking this dancer and her troupe to come through and do their thing. And as much as he downright probably stalked and pestered this dancer to go out with him, she kept saying, no, 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 no. Today it would be harassment. They probably didn't have such things technically back then, but it happened. So he had this devious plan. It's really fascinating on this old theater, they have literally 24 trap doors that can open. 24. We got to see that room yesterday, it was wild. So he figured when she was out doing they her- wouldn't let us, They wouldn't let us drop through one of the trap doors though. So I was, a little, I was like, I wanna jump through uh, and fall into the <laughs> bottom. And they're like, we, we can't do that. And I'm like, come on! And they wouldn't let us, but um, it, it was amazing, Lisa, that I've never seen the underside of a stage like that where you see so many places um, where it was just a really classically beautiful place. So I didn't mean, I, just, I was thinking about the trap doors and I was excited about it. Sorry, you go ahead. No, that, no, I mean, that room, I mean, I imagined like one, I wish we had a picture of it, like one trap door, but the whole 40 by 50 foot ceiling had many three by four foot trap doors and it. it was all trap door essentially, that one part of the stage. Anyway, so what he was doing is his devious plan is when the dancer came over, he'd open the door and it wasn't far enough for her to die, but I would kind of wonder about that. It looked like it'd be brutal fall from where we were standing, but she did break her leg. He figured he would swoop in, rescue her, nurture her back to life, and she would love him, except the best plans. One of the touring um, performers saw him do that and told the manager what happened. It wasn't just an accident that the trap door opened by a mistake. He did it. 
The really creepy thing is a few days later, he was found hanging from the rafters, way seven stories up, we found out, way up there. Now there's a thing that he couldn't have possibly done it and perhaps he was murdered. The story is one of the wealthy uh, theater patrons had him hung up there and his name is Tim. So he might be up in the rafters, but he also might be under the stage. And when they were using the trap doors, they would, they would go off and just open accidentally. And I can't imagine what um, a danger that is for a stage to have that happen like that. And perhaps uh, another really quickly, one of my favorite things is this uh, old theater, the Capitol Theater is one of the two Barton organs that you play that are in process and working. Right now it's getting repaired out west, but um, evidently Mac, the organ player, loved playing so much and even when they had movies happen, he would come in late at night and play the organ for the overnight crew while they cleaned up. So once in a while they say you catch the organ playing by itself when no one's there and maybe it's just Mac showing off. Well, that's what we're hoping. Lisa and I tried to get some EVPs in that organ room yesterday. And so uh, I'll go over the tape, the tape. Welcome to 1975, everybody. Uh, but I will go over that. Is it uh, a reel to reel? In, <laughs> right? Super reel to reel. It was on the vinyl. Um, no, but we'll go back and see um, if we captured anything in our little ghost hunt at the Overture Center. And that's actually gonna be online uh, as far as the ghost light at the Overture Center uh, where they tell the ghost stories of the place. And then uh, Lisa and I got to do got to do the Ouija board on the big stage. Uh, yeah, so it was work. a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, more ghost stories. T, why don't you regale us with one of your favorites? Um, tomorrow we're gonna talk about maybe some of the little less uh, known stories of Milwaukee. Um, because I know between you and Allison, you have about a million things that I bet people haven't heard before or are in a lot of books and from experiences and, and, and talks you've had. Um, but T, why don't you tell us one of the favorites, one of the, that you either like to tell or that has always fascinated you uh, about Milwaukee hauntings. It won't let me unmute my mic. Oh, we can, oh. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Sorry, my computer was. Oh, it unmuted, and we got to unmute you again. So, uh, if you hit the uh, uh, unmute button, hold on, let me see. I can. Un I think I can unmute you. All right, now you can try. So, T, I bet if you say something now, we can hear you. Ah, uh, no. All right. It looks like uh, T's quiet for a second there. Um, you might need to reload your browser uh, so we can make sure that's working. Um, all right. Right. Larry, don't you love tech issues? I do. Do love tech issues. So we're going to give T a chance to restart uh, or reload and get back in here. And then uh, Wendy, um, why don't you give yourself an unmute and see if you can jump in uh, on a story here and tell us one of your favorites. Wendy does the Waukesha ghost walk. Um, can you Judy, hear me, T Major Tom? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yes, come on okay. in. Okay. Excellent. All right, we're off to a good start. The microphone's working. So, well, yes, Waukesha. Uh, my tour runs right along the Fox River, which is an absolutely beautiful place to take a stroll. And downtown Waukesha, just in case you haven't been there, I uh, have a quick little slide I will show you. I think it, there we go. As you can see, can you see it? It's spooky at night. <laughs> it's beautifully sp spooky at night. And we like to walk right along the Fox River where there's all kinds of paranormal fun to be had. But what I wanted to share today was a story about um, a bridge that crosses the Fox River. And you can see the bridge as you're on the river walk. In fact, if you take the river walk going north, you can actually go over this bridge and it's on Moreland Boulevard is the uh, road. 
that crosses the river and then it meets, it crosses over Highway 59 or the, what used to be Highway 59. I think it's uh, St. Paul, Ave, East St. Paul Avenue now. So that bridge has an interesting story that dates back to the 1930s. Apparently there were some teenagers that were riding along in a car and um, there were also some railroad tracks that were like par running parallel on that bridge. And the car was in an accident and flipped. And tragically, uh, the, one of the girls that was in the car died in that accident. And the legend is that what happened was her body actually flew into a passing railroad car as it was going along those railroad tracks parallel to the road. And so she was missing for quite a while. And they ended up not finding her for miles and miles away, finding her body, which is absolutely tragic. Um, but what's interesting from our standpoint as ghost tourists is that at the bridge is the site of a lot of green lights that people report seeing there and kind of a, a misty, foggy green light. So there actually was an article in the Milwaukee Journal back in 1984 of a story of a mechanic who was heading home late one night and just you know, happened to be crossing the bridge when he saw a green light that was about the size of a stop sign. And he saw it floating ahead of him on the road. So just imagine this it's green light, you know, it's not, not, a, not a traffic light, like an actual floating sort of ball of glowing mist. Uh, uh, it floated around, it started coming toward him and it, as he described, attached itself to his vehicle and spun the vehicle around out of his control, at which point the vehicle died and the the green light floated away. And um, th after the car was, you know, it was completely motor dead and everything. And then after the light went away, the car just started up normally. And I imagine he hightailed out of there pretty quickly. <laughs> but just an interesting story, which, may, you know, who knows if that's related to the tragedy that happened there so many decades ago or not, but just a, a really interesting ghost story there. But there's also been a lot of other types of ghost sightings in the uh, area that act, which <clears throat> back, way back when, um, back in the sixties, actually not that long ago, but relatively, uh, students actually reported seeing under, a, there was like a viaduct. Now this is a different area of Waukesha, different, um, actually on what's currently Highway 59. So we have a little Highway 59 connection there. But there were some teenagers that were out doing their teenage thing. And um, they reported seeing under this viaduct uh, basically some disembodied heads floating. Huh. So there, there was a youth, and it was, again, reported in the newspaper. So we have a little bit of a record of this that, you know, they described it as two heads that quickly took cover behind a bush. So, but they weren't human heads. <laughs> um, and so this spurred a whole ghost hunting like extravaganza in Waukesha and students were out investigating for themselves as you do and uh, looking to, to try to spot these things themselves. And it actually became quite a, a, almost a problem where the police were reporting that there were groups of up to 40 students out hunt, hunting for ghosts. So. Waukesha has a long history of people out looking for these interesting legends and a city with as much history as it has and as much uh, water flowing through it, buildings made out of our favorite limestone that likes to capture and retell stories. It's just a fascinating place to go and check it out. And that's just a little taste of it for you. You're muted, Mike. I got all excited and forgot to unmute myself. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that, that, that brings up. Number one, when you're talking about ghost hunting parties in Waukesha, um, there are, you know, you talk about that happening like in the 1960s. Um, and that was also popular in like the early part of the 20th century. In fact, there's a, um, hmm. uh, there's a story from like 1910 in Waukesha about where Waukesha Memorial Hospital is on that big hill. They call it Tower Hill. And so, 
um, there's a story from one of the newspapers about people having ghost hunting parties to try to find the mysterious ghosts uh, that were in the tower. Because by the 1910, the, the tower that was up there was already abandoned. Um, and so people were going and doing ghost hunts there. 1889, there's a story. Um, Carrie Morse and her family uh, had a, uh, they were having like a, a, a seance on Halloween. And they talk about a, a full As specter. You do. Right, as you do, and they talk about a full <laughs> specter that walks through the house. Oh, um, yeah. But you know, one story. One story I wanted to tell actually is from outside of Wisconsin, and it's from Stillwater, Minnesota. And you're talking about the Fox River, made me think about it. And I'm like, oh, I want to tell this story because um, it's just one of those uh, weird turn of the century things. And a lot of times when we're looking at ghost stories. Um, and especially the stuff that we do for American Ghost Walks, we go, we try to find the stories and connect them to modern history. We connect the history of the building to the um, the people that lived there, to the ghost story that people have experienced and try to turn it all into one thing. Um, so the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin, if you guys have ever taken I-94 from like Milwaukee, Madison to St. Paul or Minneapolis, you know, you're gonna go over a huge river, the St. Croix River, that beautiful bridge when you pass Hudson, Wisconsin, um, when you when you cross over into Minnesota. And it really does, you, it feels like you're, cro you know, you're crossing the, the actual line of the border. Like if you were looking at a map, you'd be like, wow, I'm actually crossing the border line. Um, that's the St. Croix at its most majestic, wide and powerful. Um, and so the turn of the century, um, well, St. Croix River was called the River of the Grave because it was a place where uh, the native tribes to Minnesota had buried their dead. And also um, because of all of the logging industry that was going on in Minnesota, a lot of young men had gone up uh, into northern Minnesota and you know, to, to log and to make their fortune, some of them didn't come home and their families were desperate enough to, desperate to find them. And there is a, a superstition that was common in the 19th century, even enough that it made it to Tom Sawyer, that uh, what you need to do is put mercury or quicksilver into a loaf of bread and throw it into the water where you believe the person you care about went in. And the body was supposed mm -hmm. to float up to the surface so you could get some closure. That idea that mercury inside the thermometer, right, would rise and fall and stuff, the quicksilver. They thought that quicksilver inside of bread, you threw it into the water, uh, would help it find the body. Now, um, when people needed to find bodies in the river, there was actually a specialist in it uh, in Minnesota. And his name, his business card said, John Jeremy, expert recoverer of drowned bodies. And he was known as Fisherman John. His background was a mystery, even to the people that knew him well. Um, he was said to carry a mysterious sack around his chest that no one could ask about. He said it wouldn't, he wouldn't work in the presence of other humans, and he would only work at night. People said he had a trained muskrat who was an expert at finding dead flesh, or that he was a water witch who used a dowsing rod to find the bodies of people's loved ones. Fisherman John's record was that he found 104 bodies from Florida to the Pacific Northwest and his bounties ran from 50 to $500. He said that he learned a secret from the Sioux and he passed it on to his son and even his grandson who ended up having to find the body of Danny Dodge, the heir to the Dodge Motor Company of Detroit. Now Dodge was on his honeymoon in uh, Manitoulin Island in Lake Ontario when he decided to use some sticks of dynamite for fun. So he's on his honeymoon, he's probably drunk, and then he's like, I'm going to light off some dynamite. He's a rich kid. What do you expect? Now they just go to Bonnaroo. Back then they blew up dynamite. Well, that ended up poorly for Danny um, because obviously the dynamite backfired and he shouldn't have been drinking and playing with sticks of dynamite, Dan. Uh, the, the nearest hospital was by boat. They threw him in the boat and they sped towards their destination. But swelling waves and harsh winds threw poor Danny into the water while they were on their way. The body was lost for several weeks, and the Dodge family offered a $15,000 reward. Canadian authorities brought out tugboats, helicopters. They couldn't find the body for four days. The family was paying locals the practically royal sum at the time of $20 per day um, to try to find Danny's body. The grandson of Fisherman John, George Thompson, goes out. He finds the body in a matter of hours. Since then, people have seen shadowy figures uh, that they claim is da uh, Danny Dodge, and it even inspired a screenplay that somebody wrote about it. So 
Fisherman John was Stillwater's finder of drowned bodies, and he could even pass that skill onto his children and grandchildren. What was in the sack? We'll never know. Uh, but Wendy, when you were talking about the Fox River, it just made me think about that. Um, I was just like, oh yeah, I forgot about Fisherman John. This guy had a card, the finder of drowned bodies, and he was able to do it for some reason when nobody else did. And so um, it was just, uh, I, I mean, I find it fun. I, I think my, maybe most of the people on the on the uh, webcast today will be like, oh yeah, drowned bodies, kind of fun. We love ghost stories, right? Most people may be horrified uh, by it. All right. Uh, I, I've got a question for Wendy. Uh, someone was asking yeah. in the chat room, uh, what did those floating heads look like? Were they animal-like? You know, they weren't human, but what, what, yeah. uh, what made people know the that they weren't human? The research, the research that we did um, was there wasn't a whole lot of detail in it, so we have to kind of use our imagin imagination a bit. It just described them as disembodied heads, human-like disembodied heads, appearing and disappearing into the bush. So, um, yeah, that, that's it's, super uh, cool because uh, there are. I wish um, there was more. Yeah, there there are stories um, of uh, the Haudenosaunee people. Uh, in in our area, Oneida people are Haudenosaunee, um, so they might have more stories of these floating heads. But you know, certainly Mohawks, uh, the Mohawk uh, talked of floating heads, and there's also a lot of uh, stories in uh, the Philippines, I believe, of uh, vampires that uh, you know are normal people during the day and then at night their heads detach and they go um, floating about um, looking to, to suck the life out of babies and uh, wow. pregnant women. Wow. Close well, your sure, windows, everybody. I sure <laughs> wish we had more. I sure wish we had a more detailed description, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, apparently it was enough to intrigue, you know, big bands of students to go out and try to spot it for themselves. So yeah, maybe, maybe on one of my walks, we'll get to, catch a that, glimpse sometimes. And that's hopefully. a great idea that actually, you know, finding a way to, and this is, this is part of the thing guys, when we're talking about haunted history and finding connections between stuff. So this floating head story, and then Allison knows a native legend about it. So that's the kind of thing we want to connect to um, when you're working on tour or something like that. You want to make sure you find all the connections. Is there stuff from different cultures that is similar? Um, you know, is there something connected to the history of the land or maybe even the people who are visiting, maybe they're not from there. Maybe the ghost might not be from the area. Um, but it's, it's finding all of those places and trying to connect it together um, to see, well, do I think we're ever going to get to the bottom of it? No. But it, it, it's to try to get as close as possible to finding um, some kind of background uh, is, is really part of the fun. Okay. Now, T is back in the room. Oh, Wendy. Oh, just real quick, I was going to say, too, that, you know, hopefully it's possible that someone on the tour might have been part of one of those groups at some point. So I'm always hopeful that when I tell the story, somebody will say, I remember I was in high school and we did this and, you know, that might have some more detail to add to it. So that's that's just a little fun hope. Well, Lisa <laughs> knows that sometimes you get people who are um, sensitive on the tour, right? And they'll be like. Like what, what? What was your best example of that? Where somebody who was sensitive came out and said something? Oh, I have a group that tells me about the Majestic Theater and the ghost named Joe James Jimmy. He changes his name. In the beginning, when I started doing it, Mike gave me you know the script and it said the theater people said his name was Joe. Then about five years ago, a typical woman who was well behaved to that point, and I said, and his name is Joe, blurts out, well, why do you say that? She afterwards told me that she's a medium and he wants to be called James. I'm like, cool. Did that for a few years. Last summer at the beginning, after my tour, a very nice young woman comes up and says, oh, he wants to be called Jimmy. And I thanked her and I made note of it. And I didn't tell a soul I thought about this. I can't change my tour for everything I hear, right? Right. Especially for yeah. some rando that comes up. It's like, well, call him Jimmy. It's like, but okay, Yuri know. Geller. So the next, within three weeks, three weeks later, I had my own two mediums come and kind of um, a promotional tour with a paranormal blogger and a photographer. And afterwards we went out with a drink and I didn't hear what everybody was talking about, but I checked the blog a week later 
And sure enough, my two trusted mediums are like, yes, and he wants to be called Jimmy. So that's my favorite ghost at the Majestic. I, 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 I love it. I love it. Okay. So T, now you're back on. Um, what's one of your what's one of your favorites? Well, I'll, I'll tell you two short ones. Great. Um, so first there's the crowd pleaser, and then there there's my favorite one. So first, I guess I should say, um, you know, there's there's actually three tours in Milwaukee. Uh, there's the Third War Tour, um, and Allison uh, wrote that one as the first American Ghost Walks tour. Uh, the original, you might say. Um, and then there's a new Saints and Sinners uh, tour on Brady Street, which I've done that tour once, but usually it's conducted, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, by the wonderful E. Stephanie Mendoza. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we sometimes bust out what we originally called the Ghosts of Christmas Past, um, but now it's commonly called the Shadow of City Hall Tour. We're actually doing that tour once this month. Uh, I'm not sure if it's sold out yet or not. I believe but, there. I believe there are like four tickets left for that tour, and that might be the last four tickets available on, on a Milwaukee Ghost Walk until we add more dates uh, and times for Halloween. But definitely, um, if you're watching this anytime before next Friday night, don't be afraid to walk with T under the shadow of City Hall. Yes. So um, there's a story that we tell on both the Third Ward and the Shadow of City Hall tour, uh, which is uh, the story of the famously haunted Fister Hotel. Um, and that is a story that people are really interested in and uh, really want to hear about. Um, you know, I actually I'll say, OK, our next stop, we're going to talk about the Fister Hotel and people We'll do things like Lisa and Wendy just did, where we'll be like, oh, yay, we get to talk about the Fister Hotel. Um, that's because I think a lot of people are at least a little bit aware of this legacy that has where um, we've had, the last count I did, about 26 baseball players, major league baseball players that we know of, have had some sort of experience there that they've shared um, with ESPN Magazine or some other media outlet. So there's this uh, sort of rich history of baseball players getting pretty freaked out by the Fister Hotel. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there's this all sorts of things that they've experienced there, including skull-faced specters floating in the hallway and weird noises and weird whispers and scratching sounds on the walls of their hotel rooms. Um, one of my favorite props for my third ward tour, well, for both tours actually, is I actually went to a site and I was able to build a collection of baseball cards that features all of the players that have had experiences at the Fister. So it's a very good visual prop to kind of be able to flip through these pages of baseball cards and be like, all these guys um, experience something. Uh, I'll just tell you uh, uh, a little bit um, about the most recent encounter that we know of was in 2018. Uh, two players named Carlos Martinez and Marcel Ozuna, both playing with the Cardinals, um, were in one of their rooms talking about what they were going to do for dinner. Um, they're standing there talking and they say that they saw a human torso that kind of appeared in the air and was just floating there in the middle of the room. So obviously this frightened them quite a bit and they ran down the hallway to uh, one of their teammates room and they gathered together and Martinez started an Instagram live video. And I'm pretty sure you can see this online somewhere pretty easily if you Google it. Um, and, uh, so here's what he says in the video, and this is kind of loosely translated from Spanish, but he said, we're in this room together. Uh, if we have to sleep on the floor in here, that's what we're going to do tonight. If that ghost shows up again, we're all going to rush at it together and attack it. 
So, you know, uh, I love talking about this on the tour because people get a thrill out of it. And I speculate, you know, it's so strange because the Fister is where lots of famous people stay, including, you know, I know for a fact that basketball players stay there. I'm sure that tennis players and, and bowlers and hockey players and foosball players or, or whoever, uh, they all stay there, but we get all these stories from specifically baseball players. So it's that's, uh, I think, as big of a mystery as the floating torsos and skull face specters. So, uh, you know, what is it? I mean, I guess the Fister has something against baseball players or they're trying to help the brewers out you know by uh, uh, scaring us so everyone likes to hear those stories and i always encourage people to take a walk through the fister hotel lobby which you know you don't need to be a guest there to walk through the lobby they have a little bar and a cafe that's open to the public um so you know Check it out for yourself. Uh, there's a lot of very beautiful artwork on the walls that was collected by Charles Fister, um, who completed the Fister Hotel. So uh, the other, the story that I really like is the the Shadows of City Hall tour, uh, the namesake City Hall itself. Um, this is what's so great about you know looking into history and stuff. I really wasn't aware of this history until couple of years ago when this tour started coming together but city hall so there's two ways you can scare people right you can have this sort of creeping psychological drama or you can go for the gross out uh and the city hall story is really really most horrifying story um there's been this string of people who committed suicide in City Hall by jumping from the upper levels to the linoleum floor below them, uh, you know, which was a very hard impact and, and killed them. Um, so it's just this terrible story. Uh, this was during, you know, times like the Great Depression and the recession that followed, and people were just at their wits' end because they had lost all their money. So uh, it was, this was seen as maybe an easy way to um, kill themselves. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the story though is City Hall at some point uh, decided that they needed to stop this from happening because it was terrible. People would be going to work and someone would land on the floor in front of them. So they started thinking about different solutions to this problem and some of them kind of made sense, like they were going to uh, build uh, floors across the atrium so you couldn't see straight down. You know, there would be the middle would be filled in essentially. Um, but one of the ideas that they had, which was just bonkers, was that they were going to crisscross the atrium with razor wire. And the idea there was that uh, people would jump and it would be so disgusting because their body parts and blood would be flying everywhere that uh, they would that would deter people from committing suicide because no one would want to die like that. So uh, fortunately, I think they decided not to go with that plan. <laughs> and instead, uh, what they did for many years was they put these sort of chain link nets that swooped across uh, between the different floors of the building. So if anyone tried to jump, they would land in these nets, you know. Uh, and those were there for, you know, almost like 60 or 70 years in City Hall. Uh, finally, in the 80s, uh, Mayor Norquist did some renovation to City Hall. And he was like, okay, hopefully this problem is over with and we can remove these nets. But, um, and so uh, because of this, and there's another story too, where a city comptroller got very mad at his assistant and he actually came to work and shot him in city hall. Um, but- Tough uh, boss. <laughs> right, tough boss indeed. Uh, and you know, amazingly this guy survived the gunshot to the head, you know, 
I think it, it had to do with maybe the guns not having as much firepower in, in those days or whatever. So there is sort of this violent history to City Hall um, and uh, security guards have said that they, they hear weird noises and doors slam by themselves and they'll sometimes hear a very loud thud as if maybe a ghostly body is landing face first on the floor of City Hall. So um, it, I, one of the reasons I personally love the story is I've been to City Hall many times. Uh, I used to work as a bartender at the River West Public House. And so that's where I would have to go to get my bartending license. And if we were doing events, we had to like file for a special event permit there. So I was there many times and I did not know the story. And let me tell you, now when I go into City Hall, I view the whole building much differently. Like the first thing I do when I walk in is I sort of look up and I'm like, oh God, you know, <laughs> I can't, I just remember the story and I'm like, it's forever in my mind now when I go into that building. Uh, it's funny, T, that, you know, one time uh, my wife and I were staying in Milwaukee. We were looking for venues for our wedding and um, we were staying right across the street from City Hall at the Intercontinental Hotel. And so we were like eye level with the top floor of City Hall and it was on a weekend and there was like a huge bird who was impaled on the spikes of what, like right next to the window, but you wouldn't yeah. see it unless you popped your head out the window. You know, you'd only see it if you were across the street like we were. And it was go like you're talking about gore, like the razor wire just made me think of like this gory flayed bird, just the guts hanging out like the triceratops. And um, we're just standing at it. And I'm thinking that the person who works in that office all Monday morning, they're going to be like, what smells so bad? They're going to be looking at the, like the office mate and be like, did that guy shower? <laughs> you know, and it, they just smell this dead bird and they wouldn't be able to see it unless they open the window. And we're like, is some dead out? You know, they had to look like, take their head out. And it's gruesome. Um, so you just made me think of that, uh, this idea that City Hall uh, was gruesome for a lot more reasons. Yeah. Allison, jump in. This will be our last story before, and we'll get a link to um, Melinda's presentation. She just had some internet issues, but she's going to have a presentation on the Museum of Mortality in just a few minutes. I'm going to put the link in the notes right there. Allison, go ahead. T, I just wanted to ask you one quick question about the human torso. Did uh, they specify as to whether it was a female or a male torso? There was a, sp a, sp a specification. It just said a, a torso what looked like a human torso. So I'm not sure. All right. All right. Well, anyway, thank you. Wonderful ghost hosts. Uh, you guys are fantastic. Um, and make sure you check out uh, them on tour. AmericanGhostWalks.com is where you can find it. You can join a tour with T. You can join a tour with Lisa. You can join a tour with Wendy. Um, and just thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Uh, there's upcoming uh, next is another uh, ghost host guy, but also she has a collection of fascinating tools uh, that people, um, well, that coroners use and morticians. And she's going to be talking about the Museum of Mortality, uh, which is uh, a museum dedicated to how humans have treated death uh, over the over the centuries. So, um, and if you're watching this later. Uh, thanks for checking us out and make sure you go to AmericanGhostWalks.com. All right, everybody.